This is a Hot Pie Media Original. I think to us, high performance is like we are all in sync. We've all put our own collective and personal egos and power and control and jealousy issues aside. And I've just come in and said, let's all just be creative. Mm. That to us is the most important way to be a high performer. We ask that of everybody that comes to our set and it's amazing to see how many will actually commit to that. Hi, I'm Eric Corum and this is the Blueprint Podcast. I've spent my life helping Olympic gold medalists, NFL, and NCAA athletes be the best at their craft. Now I'm taking that experience and translating it into your life. This podcast is for busy professionals and household CEOs who care deeply about their families, career, and their health. There's an ocean of content to wade through, but I do the heavy lifting for you and distill cutting edge science, leadership, and life skills into simple tactics optimized for your lifestyle and goals. Husband and wife team Aaron Gadot and Gita Pulapilli are award-winning writers, producers, and directors known for their intimate and authentic storytelling. Gadot and Pulapilli wrote and directed Queen's Pins for STX. This dark comedy is inspired by the true story of the largest counterfeit coupon caper in U.S. history starring Kristen Bell, Kirby Howell Baptiste, Vince Vaughn, and Paul Walter Hauser. In this episode, we discuss servant leadership, betting on yourself, and using core values to drive creativity. I've known Gita since 2019 when we went through the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program together. She's a world-class human being, and you're going to be blown away with how her and Aaron are using servant leadership to create impactful and amazing movies. Hey, everybody. I have one ask for you today. If you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, please smash that follow button and leave a review. The number one thing you can do to help us grow the show and reach more people is to leave reviews. And my goal is to get to 150 reviews in the next two months. And I know that with your help, we can get that done. But before we get to my interview with Gita and Aaron, I want to let you in on a free and exclusive offer. Tell me if you know this story. You go out and spend hundreds of dollars on a fancy wearable device, hoping it will help you achieve your wellness goals. And then it ends up in the sock drawer. Sound familiar? Or how about this? You follow those cookie cutter clickbait health recommendations like walking 10,000 steps a day and all you get is anxious and demotivated when life gets in the way and you can't hit that magic number. It's time for an evolution of expectation and results. And that's where AIM7 comes in. AIM7 sets busy people free to live their values every day by building lifelong healthy habits. We use the health recommendations from your Apple Watch to create small, scientific, personalized recommendations for whatever you want to do. Sleep better, increase your energy, reduce your stress, or lose weight. If you're ready to finally unlock the power of your Apple Watch data, then go to www.aim7.com. That's AIM7.com to get early and free access to our exclusive program. AIM7 starts small and starts with you. Your health data your values to get to your thriving life. But now it's time to lean in and learn from the best. Well, Aaron and Gita, thank you so much for taking time for me today and coming on the show. I'm glad to have you. Thank you. We're glad to be here. Well, congrats on the upcoming release of Queen Pins. I am super excited to watch it. I've seen the trailer probably 50 times (laughs) and I'm like, those are my friends. Um, (laughs) But, you know, it's so cool to me that like you guys, like this is a big accomplishment, right? And it's just, to me, it's just the first big accomplishment for the rest of your career. And you've had a lot of them along the way, but you told me offline before that, before you got to this, you had a lot of rejections and you were told many times by a lot of different studios that you just didn't bring enough value to different Mm -hmm. projects. How did you deal with that? Yeah. I mean, it's funny in this business, you have to wear it's a rejection is a badge of honor. All of the best movies out there have been rejected a million times. And we just believe in ourselves. We bet on ourselves all the time because we know that the industry just hasn't seen what we know exists with this story or with us as filmmakers. And so we don't let them get into our minds because then it messes with us creatively. And we want to keep what we have in our brain creatively as pure as possible. I think partly we could look at it and understand, okay, we were coming off of a feature length documentary. 
very small budget, independently produced indie film. Mm -hmm. And then we were saying, hey, we have this script. Everybody loves this script, but yeah, it would cost 25 million to do it right. And they're saying, well, this is great. And you have this actor and that actor, and that's all great. We love the script, but we don't trust you guys. You guys don't have value in this industry. You haven't proven that you can take 25 million and do something with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you know, for, for us, it's like, well, we, we see other people getting those opportunities all of the time, mm -hmm. uh, directing a small movie and then directing, you know, huge blockbuster. Yeah. Huge blockbuster. So why, why, why aren't us? we getting that opportunity? But yeah. yeah, you just look at it and you say, okay, like, what can we do? We can change the equation by betting on ourselves by saying, okay, we're going to change course and make something that's a little smaller budget, a little more commercial, something we feel like we can get made and we'll prove to them we'll we'll change our value. And we did that. So we, that's we, what you say when you what you mean by say betting on ourselves, like, okay, you're not gonna let me do this, but I'm gonna do this and prove to you that I, I Every time we put something out, it's excellent work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Every script that we've written in Hollywood, uh, the Crick County was on the blacklist. The untitled Sackler project that we have was a bidding war for the script. Queen Pins obviously just got made. Like we, the three major scripts that we've written out here have found a place and it's very hard to get scripts made out here. Mm -hmm. So we know... And it's not ego. It's just us writing and writing and putting in the work and putting in the work. We know we have something. We just have to keep building our credibility in this industry that we're not like one time artists. We're here for the long run and we are consistently going to deliver something of quality to you. And it's not that they yeah. they they weren't saying we don't want to make this. They were just saying we can't give you this amount of money to do it like and what would happen is they want to give you less money to do it. And you have to start uh, thinking to yourself, well, are, do you want to make a compromised version of this mm -hmm. for half the money that isn't going to be, you know, exactly what's in the script and isn't going to be what you set out to make. And, you know, we would get to a point where we'd just say, you know, you only have one shot at making a movie. Mm -hmm. You can't make it for mm -hmm. a third of the price and have it not turn out. And then a couple of years later be like, you know what, let's go make that again. Yeah. You know, it's like, so, so we would choose, well, we're not going to do this until we can do it right. So let's go make this movie queen. Pins. So they were, they were trying to mitigate risk. I mean, there it's money, it's an investment. And I think we talked about earlier, like these are high risk investments. Cause what's the percentage of food movies that fail that don't turn a profit. I mean, I don't know the, if there's actually scientific evidence of this, but it's probably about 99% don't make any money. <laughs> well, and, and then, <laughs> and then mo movies that yeah. do make money, yeah. you know, do they say they make money? I mean, we can send you an article where one of the Harry Potter movies they, they say yeah. is like in the red, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. in, in Hollywood, uh, they'll tell you no movie makes yeah. money, but they keep making them. It's Hollywood accounting. <laughs> Interesting. Like for instance, uh, Nicholas Cage has been making a lot of movies lately, right? And we can speculate as to why, you know, he got broke, whatever. And then he makes this movie Pig. And I'm like, everybody's raving about Pig. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. Cause I just saw him do some like real, like cheesy movie, you know what I'm saying? But that one's the one that like people are attracted to. So sometimes it almost feels like venture capital, high stakes, and you guys were like, no, we're third time founders that have had two successful exits. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. Did yeah. you ever want to quit? No, I no. don't think so. We're too, we don't have kids. We love storytelling. It's even, we were just talking about this today, how we met originally with Aaron asking me the question, what do you want to do with your life? And it was like the first <laughs> words out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> And what I realized and what Aaron realized was we should be making movies together. I mean, we were coming from journalism. And when he posed that question, he had always wanted to make movies since he was a little kid. He was writing scripts when he was young. And I just never knew it was possible to be able to make a movie 
for Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And Aaron didn't think so either, but together, and I think this is why our partnership works so well is that together we're out here doing it in Hollywood. So you guys met when you were journalists? Yeah. Can we double click on that? Yeah. <laughs> and the first words out of your mouth were not, you are beautiful. Can you go on a date with me? It was like, what do you want to do with your? I got to hear this story. The relationship came slightly after, but, um, you know, we were both working in television news. I was behind the scenes. She was a television reporter in Grand Rapids, Michigan at competing stations. He worked for the Fox station. I worked for the ABC station. Okay. But my, my friend was her news photographer. So all day they would go out on stories and be in a car together. And she would sort of be griping about the things about television news storytelling that she didn't like. And he would say, oh, you have to meet my friend, Aaron. He really doesn't like television news either. <laughs> So it was sort of like coming together to bond in our mutual dislike for local news. Yeah, <laughs> our jobs. So I, my first words out of my mouth were, you know, I know you don't want to be in television news. Yeah. What do you want to do with your life? Which she thought I was sort of like a total jerk for <laughs> calling her out on that. It did not as, go well. <laughs> But then it made, I, it actually did not go well, but then I really had to think about, you know, why did that bother me so much? And I realized I was so unhappy in local news and I did want to continue doing visual storytelling, but I didn't know what other opportunities existed for me. And I realized he was pulling me in a direction that I probably always wanted to go in, but didn't think it would be possible. So mm. yeah, that's, that's how we- But also we just to go back to the the quitting part, to us, when we look at our journey, it's filled with failures, but also successes. And it's always, we always feel like we're moving forward, you know, like to us, we're always, it always feels like you're pushing this rock up a mountain, mm -hmm. but like you're always making forward progress. Um, so we've never thought of quitting because it's like, you know, it doesn't okay. seem, it seems like you're just sitting there like working hard and not getting very far until you turn around and it's like, oh, mm -hmm. like we've actually come a long way. We've always felt that we've never felt like, oh, we're just uh, spinning our wheels. It always feels mm -hmm. like we're making forward progress. I want to ask you, I hope it's not too sensitive, but were there ever some lean months? Yes. Yes. Very much so. I mean, uh, from, so we we came out here in 2014 14. and we decided to write on spec. So we're not getting paid the script called Crook County. And so that took us um, about a year to write. And it ended up getting really, it got out in the industry. It was kind of like our coming out as we're serious Hollywood filmmakers writing a $25 million we have this script. exciting script. We're meeting yeah. with all of these actors. We're meeting yeah. with financiers. The script gets on the blacklist. Like there's a lot of buzz and excitement. This film keeps getting set up and then falling apart with financing, getting set up again, falling apart with financing. But, you know, then comes 2017, the third time it's put together and fell apart. It's like, okay, we've now spent years on this project without any money coming in. And we were yeah. writing other scripts during that time, but again, yeah. on spec, nobody's yeah. paying us to do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, you yeah. start, it, it's weird, you know, Gita comes yeah. from a finance background and her undergrad. So she stresses about money. Somehow <laughs> I've always felt like things will work out. And when we need it, money will appear. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's sort of been like that. I the think last, when we've gotten... Yeah close to where it's like, oh, yeah. this is tough being full-time filmmakers. Then it's like, oh, something we get a yeah. Guggenheim fellowship or we, yeah. you know, get a job writing a script for Amazon. Things have come yeah. through at the right time. And at the last moment, it's usually the <laughs> last month where we're like, okay, now where it's like a code red. And then all of a sudden it's like, we sit next to Ted Hope at a screening of a movie. And he's like, Hey, I've been thinking about this project that might be good for you. Are you interested in doing a rewrite job? And we were like, yes, we are. <laughs> what is it? And then, uh, and you know, thank God that was a huge gift for us at the right time. Because then after that, it allowed us to cover another year and a half before Queen Pins got made. So 
let me ask you this. Do you believe that your success so far has been luck or hard work and dedication? To me, I always think they go hand in hand. Like you, if you do the hard work and you set yourself up for success, then when a stroke of luck comes along, you're in a position to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. Like, I always think like just luck is like somebody's just sitting around and then like, boom, they get lucky. A million dollars falls on their head. Right. To us, it's like if we weren't grinding away and doing all of these things and putting all of this stuff out into the universe, then those moments of luck wouldn't present themselves. And then you also have to take advantage of something. Like even when there's luck, it also involves like, okay, a door has opened, but now we have to actually go through it and push hard. Mm -hmm. You have to take the risk. And I, you know, we've set our lives up so that we can take very calculated risks, sometimes more higher level risks based off of what we want to do because we're betting on ourselves you know, but we make those choices, right? We don't have kids. We rent our house. We, we carry no debt. Um, those are all important. That's something the finance person in me was like, if we're going to do this, we need to be as simple as possible Mm -hmm. because you never know, you know, a lot of people, once they get their next big project off the ground and they make a lot of money, the first thing they do is buy a price, a house they can't afford. They start buying the things that they want to live a lifestyle they can't have. And for us, we always said like, it's, we're two people. We don't need anything glamorous and huge or any of that stuff. We just need to make sure that in 10 years, we still have a roof over our head and we can keep telling stories. So you have a long burn rate. You just want to have a good burn rate. Yes. Or if you have children, yeah. You have to put them first and yeah. suddenly, you know, you hear again yeah. and again of filmmakers doing a job because they have a mortgage payment. Mm-hmm. They have a kid that they, you know, going to school whatever that is, we try to just eliminate those things so that we never had yeah. to do something for the money. Yeah. Mm. Essentialism, but our version of it. I like this. This is this is very encouraging. Although I'm thinking to myself, you know, I, I recently left a 15 year career and took a, and, and bet on myself, but I never really thought about the kids, not in a bad way. I was just like, we're going to get this done. So I never really thought that the food would, and also, you know, I had money set aside, but I never really thought about that. And now I'm thinking like, am I a selfish jerk? But, um, no, (laughs) you have a spouse and what they do something like for us, it's hard. Yeah. We had, I should say that. Yeah. We had fail safes. Haley's my wife's a doctor of physical therapy she could always get a job like in a month if something happened. Yeah. We we are one of very few married couples doing this where you yeah. don't have the spouse yep. that is maybe like out there getting a regular paycheck. It's like we're yeah. we're both yeah. you know betting betting on ourselves at the same time. But our philosophy has always been we fail together, we succeed together in every every aspect of our life. And we ask that you know all of our failures have been we disguise as future opportunities. We never realized it at the time, but every time there was something so devastating that we thought in trying to get a film made, I remember going into our backyard when we thought Queen Pins was finally going on March 13th of last year. And then March 16th. Huh, March 13th. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. We were supposed to open production offices on March 16th and yeah. on March 13th, everything shut down and and it went away and then it was like oh and now with covid costs to actually do a production during covid you need another couple million dollars and it was it was always these situations where it's just like oh you're almost there and then the goal the goal Goal post post has changed miraculously we were able to finally get the production up and going and finding um, a studio to basically cover the rest of the cost because they needed movies in their pipeline. Mm. So it was a win-win, a win for them and a win for us. And you had the talent uh, attached. You had the whole thing set up. Yeah. Everything was ready to go. And then, you know, that's, that's nine out of 10 times, you know, when it, it is a sheer miracle that a, a good movie gets made. We don't know how bad movies get made, but we, no, it's a sheer miracle for a good movie to get made because it nine out of 10 times, you'll just hear all the horror stories of the film and the film package and the financing unraveling. And it's either an actor falls out, the financing falls out, it's always something. 
but it's, it's when it goes, you're just like, wow, is it really happening? I mean, I, I think the reality is it's a sheer miracle that any movie gets yeah, made. True. <laughs> and with every movie, there's yeah. like a million reasons it can fail. And you're navigating that. Like yeah. there are so many reasons that queen pins could have failed and not been as good as we think it is, yeah. but you, you yeah. sort of succeed in spite of those things. If you have, if you have all the positive momentum moving forward and yeah. you, you know, navigate it properly, then it becomes, Oh, not only did you make a movie, but you made a good movie. So the movie went into production in the fall of 2020, correct? So March 16th shuts down, everything falls apart. You find that your STX, right? Mm -hmm. So now you're a partner with them. You get the financing you need. Now you're going into a COVID, like there's no playbook for this one. You know, no. I would love to understand how you set up an environment where you could thrive and shoot a, you know, a really good film with all of these restraints and what those restraints look like. And then second, I know we talked about servant leadership a little bit and I want to understand like how you applied that to your team and what role that played in helping unlock creativity. Well, servant leadership was part of the reason we realized that we had to make this film when we were going to make it. We, we wrote a letter to our cast and crew and we said, you know, we, we are responsible for keeping you all safe, but we truly deeply believe that we can do something special by giving people a chance to laugh and have joy. And when they come out of this experience of this pandemic, they'll have something forward to look, look, look forward to. Mm -hmm. And so we, part of servant leadership to us is really being collaborative, listening, bringing people together and saying, let's all be in service to the story in the but, most profound ways. But we also knew early on that we were going to be asking a lot of people and, and big sacrifices and how do we get that buy-in? Because it's not just going and making a movie. It's asking all of these people that do have kids at home and families and people to worry about uh, to go on this journey with us. And part of that letter was sort of spelling out, you know, here's the journey we're going on. Mm -hmm. Here's what we're promising you can expect from us. And here's what we're asking of you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it was a big sacrifice because it, it actually wasn't so much about how do we keep you safe on set? Because we quickly sort of had some of that stuff in place and you're mm -hmm. testing every day and everybody's masked and everybody's wearing face shields and, you know, that was the safest place to be. It was, we're asking you to sacrifice when you leave set. And when you go back into your life, we're saying, Hey, we're, we're going past the election, like mm -hmm. do a mail-in ballot because going and standing in line is a risk. So people went home every day. Yeah. You yeah. guys didn't bubble them somewhere. No, we couldn't no. afford to. So we how did you get buy-in? Like, like you're asking people to like, yeah, I'm just interested. Like, what did you do to get that buy-in? I mean, we shot over Thanksgiving. So yeah. it's saying, hey, don't yeah. celebrate with anybody but your immediate family, like yeah. those kinds of things. We said to them, it took us six years to be able to get from our last film to this film. And we all have a calling and a purpose to be able to bring joy and happiness to these people that are really waiting and suffering right now. Will you help us get to the finish line with this movie? But that also means if we shut down at any point, we're not coming back up. The movie is done. We right. have to all walk away. So like when you think about a 30 day production and we're on day 25 and then you're getting to day 26 and, and 27. And COVID cases are spiking in Los Angeles and you yeah. are walking a tightrope. You're saying, hey, like, let's not drop the ball now because our budget was so low that there are costs associated with a positive COVID case and we're going to shut down for two weeks. It costs money to shut down. It costs money to come back up that we didn't have. So it's like you guys are shooting 35 straight days, right? 30, 30 straight 30 days. Straight day. 30 I mean, days you made this movie? Seasons. Yeah. Yeah. 30 production yeah. days. I mean, and what was that? Are critical. Every yeah. day is critical. You can't yeah. lose one. Shooting nights, shooting during the day. Like, like how, like the pressure must've been really high. 
Well, it was high, but also think about it. it was, so COVID regulations required us. Usually you have 12 hour shoot days. With COVID, they told us you only have 10 hour shoot days. But now on top of that, you know, on a 12 hour day, you take a lunch break, you basically have other breaks within all the COVID you, protocols. You end up being there for like 14 hours. And now yeah. it's like, now you have a hard 10. Yeah. And in addition to that 10 hours, there's a lot of COVID protocol that's going to yeah. suck like two more hours out of yeah. that 10 hours because, yeah. you know, every little bit, it's like, okay, we got to clear the set and we have to sanitize yeah. it and we have to give everybody a break to go out and take their mask off somewhere. Yeah. And so yeah. you're doing it in maybe like two thirds of the time you would normally yeah. have in a day. I mean, we had like eight hours if we we're lucky, but what we said is we're not cutting scenes because every scene in our script has a purpose. If we're going to start sacrificing scenes, we're going to not deliver the movie that we all are expecting it to be. So we had to come up with creative. Our team came up with really creative ways to be efficient. And really, we prepped so much with our cast so that they knew exactly what they were doing when they got onto set. Could there you, was no could you questioning. Talk about some of those things you did to be really efficient. I mean, little things like even working with the cinematographer and saying, okay, wh what scenes yeah. here can we identify that maybe yeah. like you're playing the whole thing on like your one master shot and th that's how the scene is playing because yeah. it's a yeah. short scene and we can come up with a creative composition to just let it play. And then we're going to save our time mm -hmm. for this other scene where we're going to want a lot of coverage and we're going to want like many different setups because normally when you have the time, you're getting those setups yeah. and that coverage in every scene. Yeah. Hmm. Or but, another example, would, oh, sorry. No, or ahead. another example is with our actors, we knew we didn't have time to do any rehearsing with them on set when we were in production. We knew we had to like really go quickly. But what we did was in prep, we did an exercise that we all learned around core values. And it was mm -hmm. really saying, um, what are your personal core values? But then what are your core values for your character? And once we were able to identify the core values for the character, when we were on set, we'd say, okay, Kristen, like, what about this scene? And she would say, well, I think Connie would do this because my core values are X, Y, Y, and Z. <laughs> yeah, so, like in this scene, yeah. I really think Connie would do, do yeah. this because one of her core values yeah. is achievement. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. and it, that might not be Kristen's core value, but it was really interesting once yeah. we did the core value exercise for yeah. their characters, how yeah. they would use yeah. that uh, in, in their prep and in their decision-making. And that decision-making was done a lot quicker. It was like, oh yeah, if that is her core value achievement, then yeah, of course she would do that. As much this is the behavior that she would do. Mm -hmm. That is such exactly. a cool thing. Does Mike Hemphill know this? Mike Hemphill does know this. He's, <laughs> really proud. He's very proud. <laughs> Did you use the same PDF? Yes. <laughs> uh, so for those that don't know, uh, Gita and I were in um, the Presidential Leadership Scholars Program together, and that's how we met. And one of the things that we learned about was core values. And we're taken through an exercise. I've actually used it with my company, AIM7. So we come up with our company core values and then our individual core values. And I think it's fascinating that you're using this with your actors and, the, and their characters, which is so cool. That's a great idea. Well, it worked. It was a First time we wanted to try it and just see what would happen. And then when we realized how efficient it was on production, we'll, we'll always be utilizing the core values exercise. But also what we found out was yeah, the truth of it is if you're not honest with your core values from the start, if you're thinking in a group, you're doing your core values and you are wanting core values that you're not really living or believing in that these are your core values, then you can very easily see on a production under a high pressure set who actually is living to their core values and who isn't. Mm. So it's also a great litmus test of like, are we all living our core values that we say we have? We're going to take a break for just a moment to talk about how you can get exclusive content designed for high performers just like you. If you're looking for information and resources to improve your health, well-being, and performance, then sign up for my free high-performance newsletter, Adaptation. Just go to www.ericcorum.com and sign up now. This newsletter is my effort to bring zero cost, high performance resources and tools with anyone with a desire to improve. Now back to the show. You also mentioned offline before that you use servant leadership to remove ego, to optimize creativity. Can you talk about that? I mean, there's certainly a lot of ego, probably in any industry, but certainly in Hollywood, there's plenty of ego to go around. No. 
<laughs> and, and a lot of directors and a lot of film sets sort of lead with like a ego based leadership. You know, it's like they come in and it's their vision. And, you know, for us, even before we understood servant leadership, you know, every day is a collaboration with us. And we've always wanted to be collaborative on a film set. This sort of gave us the framework of what we what we were really searching for, which is, you know, yeah, let's let's get all of us to remove ego. And, you know, we're saying we're removing our ego. We don't want to replace it with your ego. We want we want everybody to remove their egos and service the story. And if you keep repeating that enough and keep reminding people enough, you know, it it works, Uh, you know, and there's times where under stressful situations, suddenly somebody comes with their ego and you need to sort of like keep it in check and stuff. But for the most part, it felt like everybody was there for the right reason. Everybody was trying to service the story. I think it works when you know that, like we've always said any, no, we'll take any, no, you know, that's important for us because if anyone has a good idea, you know, selfishly as well, we as the directors win. If it's a great idea that we can implement that we didn't think about that is in service to the story and is a refreshing concept, like let's pursue it. Mm -hmm. So we want to give everybody the access and freedom to be as creative as possible. Also, we're hiring the best of the best to come to the set to work with us. The best of the best of their skill sets. Why do we want to hamper up and say, no, we only want you to do this specific thing without really opening it up to say, well, Tell us what you're good at. Or, Tell or us we're, your ideas. We're not production designers. Why do we want to go to yeah. our production designer and pretend to know better yeah. than they do? And, yeah. you know, they are, they yeah. come in with their expertise and it's like, we yeah. want to use that. Yeah. But also being that collaborative and making everybody feel like they have ownership over it is part of that buy-in yeah. of, okay, but now we're also asking you to sacrifice. Yeah because of all of the yeah. COVID protocols and all of that, like it all yeah. went hand in hand. Like so you, everybody felt invested. Yeah. So they were much more willing to say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm going to yeah. really quarantine every night when I go home, mm. I'm not going to go out to a restaurant and eat somewhere. I'm not going to do these yeah. things that could bring COVID onto the set. Yeah. Nobody wanted to be the one that was going to fail for mm. this. So problem. they were bought into the team. Yes. Yeah. If the production got shut down, would people not get paid? Yeah, I don't think well, so. Well, I mean, I think like there was an insurance yeah. policy in place that would basically cover yeah. the movie falling apart, right. but it wasn't going to ever bring us back up. And, yeah. and, you know, that was another thing that we had in our favor is everybody was excited to work because everybody had not been working for the most yeah. part up to that point. That but, makes a lot of know, sense. Yeah. yeah. Now, when you have a time box of 30 days um, and you have a lot of creative people and people or ideas are just, you know, percolating, right? Do you ever have to put constraints on those ideas and be like, hey, like I call it innovating between the lines. Like we have four, four lanes on a highway. You can go on any four lanes you want, but like we got to have boundaries to this thing. Did you ever have to be like, hey, like I love that idea, but it's just like we got to. We got, you know, we got this thing, we got this time where that's the constraint we're working under. I don't think so. I think one of the biggest things for us is we always said to everybody, Aaron and I are the gatekeepers of the story. Mm -hmm. We will want to make sure the best ideas that are in service to the story get through on the ones that aren't. But we're pretty good about, we have to do it in screenwriting all the time. We have a bunch of ideas that we throw back and forth, but we have to filter it very quickly and say, is this in service to the story? Or is this in service to something else? Just because it's a good joke or a great line of dialogue or a great character action. Like if it's really not in service to the story, we have to sacrifice that. Mm. And there's also, you know, within film production, there's prep. So, Mm -hmm. you know, the first eight weeks it's prepping the movie and that's where you do have more time to talk things through and hear people's ideas and hear from different department heads once you get to production, it's much more execution. Mm-hmm. And there's certainly things that happen on set in the moment where it's like, oh, wait, look at this. What if we do this? And you have to decide very quickly, like, yeah, does that work? Is that in service to the story? Mm-hmm. But I think the bigger 
the biggest sort of decisions like that, hopefully you're able to do in prep where you're there, everybody's working on the movie, but you're the, the time element hasn't started in yet. Like once you start those 30 days, like you're saying, it's like time is definitely a factor in prep. You might spend a day where you're just going down a road of like, yeah, could we do it this way? Is this possible? And you're able to explore it more because you have a little more leeway. This is such a cool story. I mean, (laughs) just a unique thing that like, you know, God willing, like this whole pandemic thing goes away. Right. Mm -hmm. But you, you have, you were able to execute under the worst conditions that I think that we could have faced. And you're putting out such a great product. The things that you and the cast and the production crew learned during this time can only help down the line. Like they're going to be able to look back on this and be like, you know what? We did this really special thing. Have you guys ever heard of core values before? I think that would be really helpful. I mean, seriously, like it's it's a it's a next level of leadership, and I'm just really like th- this is this is pretty stinking awesome. Um, yeah, I actually ahead. have an example of what we were just talking yeah. about. Like in prep, we would do um, these Zoom calls with Kristen and Kirby, like their characters are best friends, and then with Vincent Paul, uh, who end up being partnered up and. We would be going through all of the scenes and, you know, Vince, Vince has been in a, a million amazing comedies and brings a lot of that to the table. And we wanted to really hear from him and hear from Paul, but like really talk through the scenes. And, you know, even along the way, he plays this postal inspector who, you know, ends up getting involved in this because they're sending these coupons through the mail. And, you know, he's very uh, justice is like his at his core, yeah. like he's, yeah. and he was saying, you know, it would be funny if maybe like I carry around these like old letters that mean a lot to me that are, you know, like world war one letters or something. We we're kind of laughing at that, that he would just pull out, you know, a random letter from world war one to show like the power of the mail. And, you know, it was just something he threw out there that we thought was funny. And before we know it, you know, our friend who was working on the movie with us, he's like, you know, my grandfather fought in World War One and would send these letters to my grandmother. And I have a bunch of them still. No way. And he, you know, before we know it, his wife is like shipping these letters out to us and we're looking at them and we're going back and forth with Vince and Paul. And we're like, let us take a crack. We'll, let it, we'll take some of these and kind of write something. And you know, it's like he does have these letters that become part of this, his character and in this movie. And they're based off these actual letters from, you know, our friend's grandfather that he wrote to his grandmother. And something like that happens during prep that becomes something in the movie that we really cherish that becomes like a love letter to the post office uh-huh. and the power of writing a letter but and it the was meaning all... of what a letter means to people. Like, I mean, we it allowed us to remember why it's so important to reach out to the people that you love and send them a letter. Putting your words on paper means something and shipping it off and knowing that it's going to be between you and that only per other person is going to open that letter and receive it. And that's like just this very special gift. And obviously the post office is like, yeah, I keep that letter safe on that journey to get to them. Mm -hmm. And it all tied into Vince's character so well that it's two of our favorite scenes because it just organically came together in very collaborative ways. That's pretty cool. So this is based on a true, true story. So the the, the big story and the micro story. And that's, these are the cool little tidbits to unlock. Like that you just like the world may never know about this, but there is like this special little thing inside of this movie. I can't wait to see it. Like I'm, I'm super excited. Um, I sent you guys three questions in advance that we always ask on this show because this show is about high performance in any domain, you know? And so what does it mean? What does the word high or the phrase high performance mean to you? I mean, to us, it really means that in terms of a production, in terms of us, it's like we're living our core values. We're being able to be as collaborative as possible so we can all focus on the task at hand and serve the greater good, which in our case is always the story. Yeah, I think when it when it comes to film production, Mm -hmm. if we're living our core values and hopefully everybody else is and we're all working as a cohesive unit, you know, you 
usually the first few days of a production are tough because everybody's sort of figuring things out and mm-hmm. everybody, you know, the actors are coming in and they're, they're still figuring their characters out. And, but a few days in, you really get into this groove where everybody's just like working as a cohesive unit. Mm-hmm. And when that's working and mm-hmm. everybody, you see like, are you making a good movie or are you making a movie? <laughs> mm-hmm. And it becomes clear to everybody on that set. And when it becomes clear that you're making a good movie, everybody gets excited because they want to work on something good that they can be proud of. And then you really just get in this groove that feels like high performance to, to me. I mean, it feels like, okay, everybody, it's like all the pistons are firing, everything's moving. Yeah. Uh, we're getting good things. The actors yeah. are in a groove. I think to us, high performances, like we are all in sync. We've all put our own collective and personal egos and power and control and jealousy issues aside. And I've just come in and said, let's all just be creative. Mm. That to us is the most important way to be a high performer. We ask that of everybody that comes to our set. And it's amazing to see how many will actually commit to that. And there's always a handful that that don't. I mean, that's mm-hmm. also the failure of it, too, is that there's a handful that can't put aside their ego. They can't put aside their power issues or control issues. Um, and that is a lot of times what you're managing for us as directors more than anything is that extra energy of trying to manage that. So what habits or practices have you guys adopted to help you consistently perform at your best? It feels like we're (laughs) adding things all the time. Like, you know, it's like we meditate and that will be really helpful. And then it's like, you know, we'll hear somebody say, you know, you know, what really works is if you kind of journal before you meditate and you know, three pages of just getting whatever's in your head out, your mind's even clearer for your meditation. It's like, okay, now we're journaling. And then it's like, the walking you know, yeah, walking meditation. Oh, we <laughs> go to Griffith Park and go for a nice hike. And yeah, you know, before long, we get up at 4.30 in the morning every day. Because, 4.30? Yeah. yeah. We get up at 4.30 because we have to start. We have so much to do between 4.30 and 10 o'clock when that's when the industry basically opens and it's all the calls and emails and urgency that happens. So between 4.30 and 10, Aaron and I have to get our minds in sync, figure out how we can get on the same page. So as co-writer, co-director, also mm-hmm. as husband and wife. Mm-hmm. So there's yeah. like a lot to like put in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what time do you go to bed? adding more. It's yeah. like, Okay, that's embarrassing, but I go to bed probably between 7.30 and 8. That's not embarrassing at all. Kudos. As somebody that studied sleep for my doctoral degree, way to go. Yeah, I love sleep. I I think it became embarrassing when her three-year-old nephew stayed up until like 8.30 or something and she was going to bed at 8. That's not embarrassing. You're a high performer. Go get it. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I think, you know, one thing that's been always testing and people will test it as well is because we are not just co-writers, co-directors, we're also married. Mm. You know, there's the personal marriage issues that you're always dealing with of like, Oh, did I say something wrong? Or did he say something wrong? That may be more personal or other people wanting to test our marriage as well. Like how, how strong is their marriage? You know? And so they'll, you know, on a set, they'll play, you know, like to their parents, we're essentially their parents and they'll play off of one or the other to see if they can get their way. And so we've had to always like adopt ways to make not only us as a team stronger in our work, but our marriage stronger as well. So there's a lot of like marriage therapy exercises that we have to do on a daily basis. Very simply, the first thing we always have to do, which we've incorporated recently is tell each other something every day of why we love the other person. Because it makes it a lot easier when you're under the gun and you're fighting with a studio or a financier or whatever else that you're doing and you're trying to figure out how to get through it, you remind yourself, well, I love how he makes me laugh in that wonderful sarcasm. And that's why we're here together. (laughs) That is so cool. I need to, I just wrote that down. Uh, I need to do that with my wife. Um, I didn't think about that power dynamic of somebody actually trying to play one person against the other, but wow, that you guys are, there's some wisdom right there through experience. I can imagine. Um, and it's really nice to know how long y'all been married. Uh, almost 11 years. 
We've been together 16 years. We started yeah. working together. I took a while to propose. So yeah. we have we had a good five years uh, that she would like credit for in the marriage. I but. totally want credit for it. <laughs> you know, her parents were married three days after meeting because of their Indian culture. And uh-huh. So the, the five years was... Yeah. I was testing. Uh, You're like, the, what is going on with this guy? Like we would have already yeah. like been shipped off and it already been done. But yeah. you guys, you know, like it's a testament though in today's culture where it's very easy for people to say, you know, divorce is, is, is through the roof that you yeah. guys have a strong marriage and that's something to be admired and to be emulated. So I think it's awesome that you're, um, you're an example to a lot of people. So you should also make, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but in a world where it happens so quick, like you guys are, it's really cool that you're doing amazing things together and you're prioritizing your marriage. You guys should write a book about that sometime. (laughs) Is there anything outside of what you just told me that you're doing right now to invest in your personal growth? I mean, we went to we, the truth of the matter is it's like making a movie is hard Mm -hmm. and then to let go of it in the world and always question, like, is it, are other people doing right by your movie? Right. It's very hard. It's very hard to let it go and know that other people are making decisions for your movie. And you want to protect it to the very end because it is like our child, Yeah. Yeah. but then as it gets handed over to different people, it's like, you want to, okay, okay, at what point can we Say, okay, it's out into the world. Right. And, you know, this industry is an industry that will make you suffer because, you know, you're, you know, they sold, somebody told us it took, takes six to eight years for this industry to really accept you. If you're talented and you're creative and you're working hard, you basically paid your dues. And we didn't know it at the time, but it, it was, it's true. We made this movie now seven years after our last indie movie and the industry does make you suffer. It makes you pay and it makes you, it never feels like every time you're trying to do one step of like something pure and joyous, there are people ready to take that away from you. Figure out some way to suck the joy out of Uh, every joyous moment that movie making is. And so we went to see, uh, we went to a Buddhist monastery and sat with this Buddhist monk and we talked with him because we said, why are we doing this? We love storytelling. We love making movies, but we're suffering all the time. But but also yeah. Gita had a plan yeah. to figure out how to avoid all suffering. You know, if there any anything, you know, if we got 90 or 95% right on queen pins, it's like, how do we correct that five or 10% that made us suffer? The finance major in you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> But but he was like, you know, you can't avoid suffering. Like, no. you, what you need to do is embrace the suffering and you yeah. need to develop the tools to take yeah. that suffering and turn it into compost so you can grow. And, you know, it, which we're just like, what are the tools? Yeah. <laughs> Give us the tools. You know, I have a close friend. He came on the podcast. His name is Clint Bruce, and he's a former Navy SEAL. Fantastic guy. And he said that great teams suffer well. Mm. And like, you know, somebody when you can suffer well together, you should listen to his episode. It was just, he's got a way with words. He's like a, I don't know. He's like a, I don't know, Renaissance man dressed as this bur- big burly guy with big beard, you know, but he, the when he said, you got to learn how to suffer well, I was like, man, that is yeah. that's strong. Cause you know, you know, somebody when you can suffer with them. And, uh, don't look Gita keep suffering because like, that's how you adapt and grow. Right. That is, that's that's how you develop resilience. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we're learning. And I think what we realize and we have to just embrace it is that this, we will be constantly tested no matter what project we're working on. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be challenging. And I think the key is we need to just find the tribe. Find the people that want to suffer with us and create the most beautiful things together. And we're so close to finding the perfect team. (laughs) I'm hoping (laughs) so we can suffer together. (laughs) I love this. So um, when this podcast comes out, the movie will have had a theatrical release and then it'll be available on streaming. Where can people watch this amazing movie from a streaming standpoint? Yeah. 
it will be exclusively on Paramount Plus. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. The date is being determined as we speak. Yeah. Uh, sometime, you know, a few weeks after the theatrical yeah. uh, of September 10th, like sometime late September, mm-hmm. October, it will be exclusively on Paramount Plus. And then if you miss it on Paramount Plus for any reason, it's also going to be on Showtime. <laughs> really? So yeah. you guys have already got the whole thing mapped out. Like it's our distribution's done. Yeah. Yeah. It's all we, we, the moment that the film sold to Paramount plus it was in profit. So, uh, the studios are all very happy. Oh my goodness. Everybody's got to be jacked about that. Yeah. Now it makes you a good excited. investment. That <laughs> makes you a good investment for the future. You know what I'm saying? Cause now you've mitigated risk and you can go, yeah, I want 50 million for the next project. Well, which to kind of take it full circle, you know, when we were sitting there saying, okay, how do we change that equation when we're being told we don't have any value? Mm -hmm. We sat down and we wrote queen pins about these two women that feel undervalued, that figure out a loophole and a scam to get around the system and find success. We didn't know it at the time. We were kind of channeling those feelings, but also it was like a three-year journey and a couple of weeks ago or a month ago, when that sale happened that day, we were, we kind of turned to each other and we we're like mission accomplished. Like Are there we tears? Just changed our value. Yeah. Mm. We just changed the equation because now people look at that and they say, Oh, they took us, you know, relatively small budget and made a comedy that sold for a large profit. Mm. Like we can bet on them. Now we can give them more money and they're going to deliver. So we, it was a mission accomplished moment where, you know, three years in the making, like we changed that equation. Congratulations. And guess what? That is going to be a date night for me and my wife. We're going to go see <laughs> Queen Pins here in Houston, Texas. And I'll be it telling is a great date It's movie. a great date movie. <laughs> she loves comedy. I know he said it's a dark comedy, but, uh, I'll have to watch it to get the dark part because the the trailer, I'm just like, this is, this is my wife's type of humor. She loves this kind of stuff. It's, it's And it's not that dark. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it, but one of the first people that, that saw an early cut said the same thing. It was like, Oh, you know, there are so few movies that I can even bring to my husband and say, Hey, we should watch yeah. this together. She's mm-hmm. like, I don't bring my romantic comedies to him. He doesn't bring me, his alien you know, his movies. alien movies where they're really robots or whatever. But she's like, well, the moment I watched this, I knew, oh, this is something we can watch together. That's awesome. Well, so people can find you theatrical release. It'll be on Paramount Plus. You're not, they're not going to miss it on Paramount Plus. They're going to pay to watch that. But just in case they'll be able to watch it on Showtime down the line, is there any other way people can support y'all and your team and the, and the, and the, and the actors and the production crew? Oh, I mean, uh, hopefully they'll just follow us and watch our movies and follow our journey and story because the more people that come and see an Aaron and Gita film or come out and support us in any way would just help us get more movies made. I also yeah. think it's kind of a word of mouth yeah. comedy. Hopefully it's a yeah. movie that you watch it and you like it. You tell your friends like, yeah. Oh, if you want to laugh or you want like yeah. something that just puts a smile on your face, yeah. watch queen pins. So hopefully if they do like it, they can turn yeah. around and tell other people because it yeah. does take that word of mouth now for a movie to break through all of the noise. Mm. Yeah. Well, you guys are fantastic, and I'm so thankful that you took time out of your busy schedule right now to to share with us this story and to encourage a lot of folks out there. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you thank so much, you. Eric. It's always been a pleasure to get to know you. You inspire me, and I'm so grateful we're friends. Thank you. If today's podcast enriched your life in any way, please support The Blueprint by sharing this with someone who you think could benefit from today's conversation. Thanks for listening. You can find more episodes and all of our other Hot Pie Media originals baked fresh daily at our home online at hotpiemedia.com, the Hot Pie Media YouTube channel, or wherever you listen to podcasts.